All right, perfect. So the Can Asian Arts Network recognizes and pays respect to the original people of this land. So for time immemorial, Indigenous peoples have cared for and stewarded the lands known to many as Canada, so that each of us today can benefit from all the gifts that the land provides. Out of respect for the rights of Indigenous peoples, it is our collective responsibility to critically interrogate colonial histories and their present day implications. We therefore work from the perspective of honoring, protecting, and sustaining the land and the people who are first on this territory to move beyond acknowledgement and into the doing. We recognize the impacts of colonial history instructors on our own communities and extend a hand in partnership to those who wish to become an accomplice in dismantling them. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Vicki Van Chow. I am one of the education facilitators here at the Can Asian Arts Network, along with Sean C. and Miranda Jimmy. I am currently based in Calgary, Alberta, on Treaty 7 territory. And I just want to thank uh, uh, support from Canada Council for the Arts and Festival Access Aziz as we re re are releasing a series of free artist workshops featuring talented speakers sharing experiences and tips for Asian Canadian artists. Uh, now we're producing a series of roundtable discussions uh, to bring together arts leaders to share learnings and ideas. So make sure if you haven't already to sign up at canasianarts.com to get links to all the in online content. Uh, this webinar as well will be recorded and will be also uh, put onto uh, the canasianarts.com as well if you knew people who wanted to attend but just couldn't uh, come to the live session. Um, so thank you again for everyone who's joining us live. I just wanted to give a warm welcome to our panelists, Sally Lee and Rima Fuller. And today uh, we are, uh, this roundtable discussion is moderated by Nancy Lee. Uh, so just a quick bio introduction. Nancy Lee is a Taiwanese Canadian interdisciplinary media artist, curator, DJ and cultural producer based in Vancouver. Uh, Nancy is a co-founder of Chapel Sound, an electronic music and art collective supporting emerging artists and current an intersectional and multidisciplinary initiative featuring artistic and educational programming for women, gender diverse artists and artists of color. They also run a DIY event and production studio in Vancouver's Chinatown, hosting cross-genre uh, shows, workshops and residencies. Uh, and as a community music consultant, Nancy has worked with Creative BC and Music BC as a grant coach and outreach facilitator to improve the accessibility of their funding programs. Uh, Nancy is also an advocate for the music community and has since developed two pilot programs with the City of Vancouver, which provided Get It Together, uh, entrepreneurial capacity building workshops, and micro grants for artists. In 2018, they were nominated for the YWCA Woman of Distinction Award for Art, Cultural, and Design. And Nancy is currently an XR workshop uh, instructor with the IM4 Media Lab at Emily Carr uh, University and the board of direct on on the board of directors of Love Intersections, a queer artist of color media, uh, a queer artist of color media arts collective. So for today, we'll be just jumping into a round table discussion with Nancy and the panelists and uh, but there will be a Q&A session at the end. So feel free to ask any questions in the QA. Q&A button below. So you'll see a Q&A button uh, on, on the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, during the discussion, also feel free to use the webinar chat that you'll find at the on the side. Uh, if there's any uh, questions about clarifications of anything that uh, is being discussed, feel free to add it there uh, and I can help facilitate your questions or if the panelists kind of catch it, uh, they can answer as well. So um, as, as the discussion moves on, if there's any resources or links or anything uh, that is provided, I'll try to uh, uh, put it in the chat so you have it as well. Um, and so for now, I will pass it on to Nancy, who will talk more about the intention for today's roundtable and introduce our panelists. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks for the introduction, Vicki. Uh, my name is Nancy Lee. Um, I am calling in from the Musqueam, um, Squamish and tsleil -Waututh Nations, colonially known as Vancouver. Um, I am honored to be here to be a moderator today because I have a lot of burning questions uh, that I want to ask our um, panelists. And uh, today, this um, the theme of this conversation is mapping out and accessi accessing arts funding. Um, there are a lot of, I guess, mysteries um, as like an artist, you know, there's lots of um, unanswered questions. And there's like this myth of like this, I don't know, arts, Canadian arts funding to me sometimes seem like a mythical creature um, that kind of just lives out there. And as an artist, you're like, I've heard about these things, but I have no idea 
uh, where to start. Uh, so uh, for the intention of today, we will be talking a little bit about uh, public funding in multiple levels of government, you know, pr federally, provincially, municipally, and then also uh, private funding um, through uh, other businesses or other organizations that create partnerships and sponsorships for um, artists or arts organizations. Um, so for our first panelist, um, we have Rima Fuller, um, using she, her pronouns, um, is a senior director for ArtsFest, a national training and capacity building program run by business run by business arts. She has over 20 years experience in nonprofit management and philanthropy across the charitable sector, including education, healthcare, international development, politics, and more recently, arts and culture. Prior to joining business and arts, she was the managing director for a professional theater company in rural Nova Scotia, helping the company gain financial resilience and expand its community footprint. Rima is passionate about the power of arts in building community and affecting social change. Having previously lived and worked in Ontario, she, curr she currently resides in Antigonish, um, Nova Scotia, with her husband and their 12-year-old twins. Rima is fluent in three languages, English, Hindi, and Punjabi, and she continues to attempt to learn French. In 2019, she was recognized by Immigrant Services Association of Nova Scotia as one of 20 second generation immigrants making an impact on the social and cultural fabric of the province. Welcome, Rima. Thank uh, you. Pleased to be here. Next, we have Sally Lee. Sally Lee is a passionate, civically minded arts leader who has been working in the not nonprofit art sector for over three decades, including involvement in grassroots, artist-run groups, mid-sized organizations, and larger cultural institutions across several disciplines, including visual and media arts, theater, music, dance, and literature. She is currently the executive director of the Canadian Independent Screen Fund for BIPOC creators. She also sits on the board for Wavelength Music, the Scotiabank Contact Photography Festival and the Toronto Arts Council, and is actively involved in advisory of Real Asian International Film Festival, where she previously served as ED. Other previous leadership experience includes serving as executive director of Carfact Ontario, board membership at the Images Festival, and the Canadian Filmmakers Distribution Center, and management position at the Toronto. International Film Festival and Soul Pepper Theater Company. As an independent consultant, her practice includes strategic planning, project management, program and policy design and planning, organizational development, leadership training, fundraising, and succession planning for several organizations. Sally has been an active member of the independent DIY music community since the early 90s, playing bass in a number of bands, including current outfits. Long Branch. Welcome, Sally. Happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you all for being here, for taking the time, because it, wow, all of you both must be so busy with so many projects that you're working on and and supporting in the art sector. Um, okay, let's just jump right into it, because I'm just reading, after reading your bio, I have just so many questions that are coming to, <laughs> to my mind. Um, yeah, maybe just kind of, I want to just get a sense of maybe just like, because as a grant coach, I often have like a quick, like 30 second art spiel about the general funding kind of scene or funding program that exists uh, within Canada. I kind of, I'm just kind of curious, like when you meet like a emerging artist um, and you're just trying to introduce like the Canadian kind of funding landscape. What is your like 30 second to like one minute kind of quick spiel uh, to kind of encapsulate this very, very complex um, system that we have here? I, I want to hear your uh, 30 second spiel first <laughs> since uh, <laughs> you do it as a regular. <laughs> sure. OK, so <laughs> I, I worked specifically in music funding. Um, obviously, I'm a media artist uh, and I have like other funds that I uh, uh, that I apply to. But when I give my kind of music industry uh, funding kind of talk, I'm usually like, OK, in Canada, um, this is music specific. Um, 
we kind of have two branches of ways that you can fundraise um, for music projects. Um, there's the industry route and there's the arts council route. And the industry route um, requires you to have uh, things like you know, revenue projections, uh, job creation, use different languages um, in order to propose your project in a way that proves that you have a sustainable uh, revenue generating uh, project to invest in. And for the Arts Council grant, uh, none of that stuff matters so much. Uh, revenue generation for future sustainability isn't really the priority. And the priority is artistic merit um, and relevance in the work that you're creating, which means uh, what kind of boundaries are you pushing with your medium? What kind of boundaries um, are you pushing with the concept uh, of your work and so on? Yeah, I think that was like 60 seconds. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I'd say that holds maybe for other <laughs> disciplines as well. Um, certainly for um, for film and media arts, where I, I guess because I guess more specifically film and um, music are these sort of uh, weird disciplines where there's a definite um, sort of commercial sector or component of it. But then there are people who are more um, artistically driven, not to say that they're mutually exclusive, but um, I would also say that there's um, interplay between those two as well, where um, like I know of filmmakers who um, they are inv involved in more commercially driven projects. So they go for that industry route um and then people who and then they'll have their sort of pet project where they'll go for the arts council funding but it's interesting that you um split it in in two between the commercial and um i guess public sector well no i the arts council stuff is yeah. public yeah arts council stuff um i i think i would have started off immediately with just focusing on public sector Arts Council stuff. And mm -hmm. um, I think for other disciplines, there's, um, uh, well, no, that's not true. I'm, I'm going to say for, um, like, certainly for, well, you, I was going to say literature, but in the in, uh, commercial sense, they'd call it publishing. In the publishing mm -hmm. sector, there's other opportunities, but those are more at the organizational level than for individual creators. Um, yeah, yeah, it's so interesting if I can jump in, um, you know, as arts organizations, we're still used to thinking about funding being public money coming in, in the form of a grant from from a, a level of government. And yet we all know there's never enough grant money, there's never enough public funding for, for art. And so you always need to supplement it with money from the industry or from the private sector. And as you were saying, Nancy, it's so much of it changes your language based on who you're talking to. Um, in the Arts Fest program, which is focused mostly on sponsorships and how to partner with businesses to get more private sector dollars into into arts, uh, we talk a lot about you know how a small organization can can access those funding. And just recently, I was in a session with someone. Um, it was a webinar, and they were talking about language with sponsors. And one of their lines stuck with me, and they said, "Talk less about your art and talk more about what people are talking about." And that was the idea of, you know, just reframing what you're talking about. So if you're doing this beautiful show, um, again, like you were saying, Nancy, you know, that's pushing the boundaries and is encouraging empathy and is promoting, you know, tolerance of different religious views, as an example. Instead of talking about that, talk about what's happening in the world and how that's related to what you're doing through your art. And sometimes it just takes you reframing what you're doing as an artist for someone to go, oh, yes, that's that's something that I should invest in because that is important. Yeah, yeah if we're talking about, you know, um, how to, you know, what kind of language you want to use and stuff like that. It's sort of a balance. I'd say the baseline thing is, you know, looking at the guidelines of any program that you're mm -hmm. Um, applying for, regardless of whether it's arts focused or uh, commercially focused. The guidelines are your key. <laughs> um, and you have to make sure that whatever you're doing, that you can uh, frame it in terms of those guidelines. Um, if what you're doing falls outside of the guidelines, um, then you have to make that decision of whether you want to kind of change the language 
or how can I reframe my project or even look at the project you're doing. And I mean, this is one thing that we can talk about later about like how great even just the process is, regardless of whether you end up getting money, um, just uh, applying for uh, external funding has a way of um, forcing uh, a creator to sit down and really think uh, critically and objectively about what they're doing and what they're trying to achieve with your project, so. Yeah, I often like when I do grant coaching, I often tell people when they write their grants, like just have the guidelines. And if some funders have the rubric open, like the evaluation rubric, just yeah. have that PDF open. So yeah. every time, because oftentimes, like, especially with some of the industry grants, like with music industry grants, like Factor or like, you know, Creative BC, Creative Alberta, Creative, like, you know, these like more industry driven uh, grants, it's like you have like a 200 word, like, character counts mm -hmm. uh, yeah. limits so you want to make sure that everything you write um, in the text box responds to something that you will be evaluated on in their rubric yeah, yeah. that is very true I will say um, at the same time though uh, a caution about using too much lingo or just parroting things that are in the question or the guidelines um, I have been on juries where um, that's been flagged <laughs> by uh, fellow jurors of, oh, they're just kind of saying what they think we want to hear. Um, a reminder that, you know, the people who are quite often on these evaluation um, uh, juries or evaluation uh, groups for any of these things, they're going to be either your peers or people, really experienced people <laughs> in the industry. So I think they, I think nine times out of 10, like you just really want to hear what, uh, what the project is and how is the money going to help you achieve that? And in what ways does the project um, uh, fit in with the objectives of the funding program? Because one thing to always keep in mind is these funding programs, um, they also have to answer to a larger body that funds them. So at some point, a funder or a granting uh, body, they need to put together information and numbers about who they funded and, you know, what, you know, how, who they funded met the larger objectives of say, like, I don't know, the, say if it's federal funding if it's Canada Council Canada Council will have to answer to Canadian Heritage for like how it fit in what what they funded fit in with Heritage's uh, stated priorities so that's why like the guidelines are are definitely this yeah like a north star for you but also don't be afraid to be um just just be honest and sincere as an artist um jurors can re read that uh very easily and they can see through um sort of too much lingo like that can definitely be a turnoff i i, I would say I, I'm yeah thinking, i'm thinking of uh visual art actually because i was on a <laughs> visual arts uh committee at the tac and there was some grants like so much theoretical jargon mm -hmm. and you couldn't really... I've read those grants before yeah yeah and you couldn't really tell well what is the actual project and what what is the vision and what is the thing that is going to be manifested at the end as a result of the funding right yeah another thing that's relevant here um also is in terms of doing your research so we might think that our project fits a specific grant granting stream really perfectly but if you can do some research and see what kind of projects have been funded in the past through the stream, because often those lists are public, because as you said, Sally, they have to, they're often accountable to a larger body and they're publishing who was funded and by how much, you know, do some research and, and see if what you're interpreting, you know, say, I don't know, maybe the way they interpret innovation is very different than the way you might have interpreted innovation for your project. And, you know, are you misreading things in terms of what the intent of the guidelines is versus how your project fits. So doing that research of past grant recipients, assuming the guidelines have not changed, 
can be really helpful so that if there are questions and you're not sure, you can talk to a granting officer or talk to someone to really clarify those things before you jump in with your framing of it. Yeah, second that granting uh, officer or grant manager conversation. I think that I think for emerging artists, like that's often like a barrier. And that's why I get hired to do like grant coaching, because <laughs> I'm kind of that person often to, you know, to kind of get them ready to talk to the granting officer, even though they could just directly, you know, these are often public servants, you know, they're working for Canada, uh, you can call them, leave them voicemail, email them. And oftentimes they can, you can tell them about your project idea. And oftentimes they can provide you information on whether your project is a fit for this particular grant that you thought you're, you know, suited mm -hmm. towards, or maybe there's like an alternative program um, that is actually better suited for the project that you have in mind. Yeah. Or maybe they'll ask you a question that you hadn't thought about and you'll go, oh, that's a really good question. Let me think about that before I write my grant application. Yeah. Um, I want to jump in, speaking of grants and uh, understanding the vision and clarity, oftentimes, you know, as adjudicators, um, we look at the budget. The budget is kind of like where um, everything is revealed. <laughs> um, so I'm just kind of curious, uh, just from, because I, I know there are audiences here that are, you know, artists, but there are also audiences here that maybe are just like emerging cultural producers or cultural workers that work for um, arts nonprofits. So um, in terms of like just budgets, um, I know with a lot of, um, you know, a lot of grant funding, it's like you have to be able to somehow zero out your budget um, in the sense that where your uh, revenue equals um, your expenses. And just from like the previous projects, maybe maybe just giving a couple examples um, of like smaller festivals or smaller organizations to something much bigger. Um, what kind of like what kind of composition of revenue uh, streams um, usually kind of show up uh, in in like a in like a small organization or like medium sized organization kind of budget? Like I'm talking about, uh, comp you know, amounts of some like funding or maybe previous projects that you worked on, like funding coming from like Canada Council, and then maybe something coming from private, or maybe some coming from ticket sales. Like, can we just have like some examples of like how complex or how many streams of funding some uh, pro it takes to like realize uh, a project? Uh, I can start um, if, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll use the example of theater because I know that one best. Um, and I'll start with saying that, in my experience, the more diversified your revenue, uh, not only the more successful the project, generally speaking, but also the more successful the grant application, because grantors like seeing diversified sources of revenue. And what that means is money coming from a lot of different places, and not just a lot of different levels of government, but you know, a combination of public and private. So uh, a typical revenue for a theater-related project or a performing arts-related project could be... Um, First, you look at your government sources. Is there any money coming from the federal government, like the Canada Council or Canadian Heritage? Is there any coming from the provincial government, your provincial arts council, uh, municipal government, your local city hall, town hall, whatever form of municipal government operates? Um, then you look at uh, from the private sector, uh, you could have a combination of sponsorships, donations, uh, which is your know, normal fundraising or one-off donations that he would have received. Um, if you're selling program ads, you know, those are sm a smaller form of a sponsorship, but those kinds of, you know, contributions. So there's your, your that's your contributed revenue. And then there's uh, your earned revenue, which is revenue that you will earn from the project if you have any kind of admission price to it. So if there are ticket sales or, you know, you're selling drinks at the bar or, or whatever you might be. So those would be the typical three pockets that would, I don't think I'm missing anything if I can please jump in. But I'm just thinking there's your government funding, your private funding, and your earned funding. And a combination of those would make up your revenue. And somewhere in there, you'd highlight what, what are you looking for from that specific grant application to make up the difference. Yeah, I would add to that, um, again, uh, going back to the guidelines things, um, depending on the funder, they'll have some guard guardrails or guidelines around the maximum um, portion yes. of the overall budget that they are uh, able to contribute. And sometimes, well, 
and there will be a, a ceiling amount as well. There, there will always be a granting range, but yeah, they will, some funders will have very specific things around what portion of the budget. And sometimes they'll even say what portion of public funding or, you know, like, so again, go back to the, to the um, guidelines and, um, and be attentive uh, to that. Um, or they could say what percentage of expenses and then you have to backward budget the whole thing yeah, to make it exactly. all. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I can't, how many times have we done that where you see what the a maximum amount that you're yeah. allowed to ask for is and you plug that in and then you work back from that yeah. and build a budget based on that. And this is another thing about creating budgets for um, grant applications. These are all projections and speculative documents and depending on again the program or the funder the you'll indicate whether something is confirmed or pending um i mean be as realistic as you can but also be ambitious and um you know optimistic um i wouldn't stress too much about um you know when you which i, I mean i have stressed out about this but um looking at those percentage parameters and then when you put in some like speculative numbers around especially around self-generated revenue or if you've got sponsorships that you're going for but you haven't heard back yet or that kind of thing yeah. don't get too caught up in it just put it in um every funder knows that at some point if they approve your funding there's going to be a point at which th they um might ask you to resubmit um, before they drop a contract. And then that's the point at which you can say, okay, well, this money came through, this did not, that kind of stuff. I mean, this is another issue around the funding stuff too, is like the timing of when you apply, when you hear back, and then when your actual project <laughs> is happening, like sometimes the timing doesn't work for that, but just do your best um, as you're moving along. And even as you're doing your project, um, you know, your expenses, they're not going to be exactly down to the dollar either. There is that part of the whole granting cycle project and then your final report. Your final report is where you're going to be able to report everything that happened, including what your final numbers were. Ideally, those final numbers are going to ad adhere. Uh, as closely as possible to uh, the last budget that you submitted to them. But, you know, like along the way, if things are going differently, there is always that space to contact that funder that you've already made contact with because you called them before applying, <laughs> where you can call them and say, hey, you know, that funding that I got, um, you know, I, I have to move around some of the, the money, like, all of that money I was going to spend on, um, I don't know, set design, um, we got a discount. So we moved some of that money to paying, you know, more for this kind of thing, or, you know, there's all these things, but the main thing is that you're still doing the main project and that you're, um, still fitting in with the larger parameters. Um, I'm just kind of curious, just you're talking about timeline. Cause I think, like some, if if you're emerging or you're new to fundraising, like uh, the timeline seems kind of it's it's ridiculously long um, for Canadian funding and some, you know, especially if you're working in the world of like theater and stuff. It's like oftentimes we're we're projecting or we're booking. I'm asking two years in advance um, to like secure a show in the future um, and um, maybe for like film festivals as well, too. Can you just kind of. I'm just kind of curious in terms of maybe giving both of you giving some examples about like how far in advance are you starting to plan um, fundraising for a project? So um, not to sound like a broken record, but a lot of times the guidelines will spe specifically tell you um, the time period in which the activity that you're applying for is to occur and when it's supposed to wrap up by. Um, I will say that, yeah, everyone is in the same boat. That is one thing. 
Um, I have been involved with organizations where a lot of the money that was applied for has not been confirmed, but it's been spent <laughs> um, before the money has been confirmed or come through. Uh, in those cases, um, it's more like annual, like for operating grants or for repeated project grants that have, you know, just come through. Um, yeah, I would caution uh, against <laughs> doing that kind of thing, um, unless you have, you know, some pretty good um, uh, prospects around self generated revenue, or private sector funding. Um, I've been asked about, you know, like, fiscal year questions too. I think most funders, they have like a March 31st fiscal year end. Um, but uh, they also understand that other that um, groups that are applying might have different fiscal year ends. So um, as long as you're, it's the same thing, you just have to conform to the funders fiscal year end. it's, it can be kind of weird, where like they'll have done their fiscal year end, but then the thing that you're doing say doesn't happen until it's it, they're done i don't know maybe i'm getting sidetracked here <laughs> it's not <laughs> um but um yeah i don't know rima what do you think <laughs> um well i was actually thinking about because nancy had mentioned fundraising so i was going to speak about uh private sector fundraising but i don't know if that muddies the waters if you want me to go there or not outside no we can we can talk about okay. it yeah all right uh, because I'm just going to pick up on what you were saying, Sally, with the fiscal year end, because that's often um, something that can be forgotten in terms of approaching businesses for donations. And it depends on who you, it is, because if it's a, a small or business or a local business and or it's a small ask, then it might be the timing of the ask might be irrelevant. But if you're looking for a substantial ask from a sponsor um, or, or a or large business donor, or it is a larger corporation where things are more bureaucratic, then timelines become important. And so, you know, if you can find out what the, the business year end is, and for some businesses, it's March 31st, for some it's December 31st, for some it's October, which I've never understood, but financial institutions as an example. Um, and for a lot of businesses, their budgets are set before the start of the year. And if you didn't get your request in before that, that timeline, then even though they might be fully supportive of your project, they just don't have money in the budget to, to support you. Um, and you're looking at two budgets from a business because you could be looking at their donations budget or their marketing budget, depending on if you're asking for a donation or a sponsorship. So I'll just add that in there as well, that it, it becomes complicated, but if it's a large ask or a large organization, then being aware of their budget timelines can also help be more successful. Can you just uh, clarify what the difference is between a donations budget and like a marketing or sponsorships budget? Because there's kind of two different ways of approaching how to uh, fundraise from like a private company. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's great to know that difference because sometimes it means you can get money from uh, two different budgets within the organization. So you can dip into two pots, which is great. Uh, so a donation would be, uh, it's the business's community investment. They, they're they supporting you because they believe in what you're doing. Um, if you want to know if you can get a business donation from a large organization, um, I'll again use banks as an example because it's something that everyone can relate to. Um, they might call it their CSR goals, which is their corporate social responsibility uh, goals. They might call it ESG, which is their uh, environmental, social and governance goals, you know, depending on what terminology everyone's using. But within that, they will have pillars say we as a company believe in supporting youth, supporting, uh, you know, uh, um, climate friendly initiatives and supporting young families. I'm just making these up. And if your project can fit with, within one of those pillars, uh, then you can ask for a donation to support your project and they will give you money and you will write a tax receipt and recognize them however you recognize your donors. Um, so that's a donation. And then if you're talking about a sponsorship, that will, again, for a larger business will normally come from their marketing budget because a sponsorship is where the business is looking to get promotion by associating their brand with your brand. So if there are ways that you can, you know, so we're talking about something the basics, like putting their logos on your posters and programs to, you know, more creative sponsorships where your sponsor is really embedded into how you're 
disseminating your art or your project. Um, but that would be a sponsorship ask. So then you're talking about what benefit they'll get out of it, what kind of promotion and visibility and recognition they'll get, and will they get access to new audiences by collaborating with you? So it's a very different conversation, um, but you can have both conversations simultaneously with a business, if it makes sense. Does that answer what you were yeah, hoping Yeah, yeah, that was, that was yeah, okay. great. I, I, wish, <laughs> I wish people had access to that information um, all the time. Um, because I think if people just, especially on the private sector, because it's it's harder to find that information or to find like a pathway to navigate that. Um, I do have a question uh, about the sponsorship uh, side of it. Like, how will an artist or an art organization approach, um, you know, asking for a sponsorship? Like, there's a sponsorship deck. Like, what are some of the key information um, that should be in these kinds of uh, packages when you request uh funding Ooh, that that's a whole talk um, <laughs> <laughs> Before we um do it, yes um, i do want to just differentiate between i'm thinking that there's probably people on here who are um individuals mm -hmm. and have their own practice yes. um i don't think um companies uh, typically support individual um creators um they will typically only uh um certainly on the csr side um contribute to um either registered charities and in some cases uh nonprofit um incorporated nonprofit organizations yeah um but there is a way to work around that as cuz i'm a, as an individual artist if mm -hmm. you can have a nonprofit or charity present your work yes. um, and ask for the funding or sponsorship through that other nonprofit or organization that is presenting your work, um, right. then that's kind of like the workaround. Right, right. Where they, yes, the organization is the, is the uh, grant recipient or the yeah. funding recipient. Yeah, uh, the presenter but organization. Then, yes, but then it's really going towards the thing that you're doing with that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, another way to work around that for individual artists uh, is even in smaller amounts. Um, I'll use the example of physicians because I've, I've been familiar with these examples where uh, there might be a physician in your community who is very supportive of your work as an independent artist, um, and they're willing to make a donation towards your project personally. Um, what they might also consider a lot of physicians have a registered business that they operate for their practice. What you could say, this, you know, I really appreciate this personal donation. Would you also consider a larger donation from your business? Because business donations come with different tax benefits for a business owner. And there might be people who have, might not have thought about this, but might be willing to make a smaller personal donation and a larger business donation, even if they're just, you know, a sole proprietor of their medical practice, as an example. Uh, so you can dip into some money. Um, the question about sponsorships, Nancy, that you had asked, which so this, you're right, Sally, this applies to an organization. If you're an arts organization looking to approach a sponsor, the information that you want to present is uh, what is your project? How does it align with what this business does? How will it help create a positive branding image for the business? And what kind of tangible benefits will they get from this? And what kind of longer term partnership potential is there? That's kind of the broad conceptual way of thinking about it. And then there's tons of resources and you know tools and templates that can be available to people. Um, and I'm happy to share a link in the chat later as well for where people can find some more of these resources, but that's the way to think about it. Probably the deck will also typically include something about like your organization. Um, yes. Like the, uh, history or some great milestones and definitely um, you don't have to be so, uh, I don't know, accurate historically, but think about the things that will jump out to the person that you're pitching, the thing that, yeah. that will stick in their mind about your organization's mission or uh, history or that kind of thing. Yeah. And oftentimes you can kind of tailor um, these decks uh, to fit with the pillars um, of the the company or the organization that you're asking uh, or requesting funding from as well. So each person gets like a personalized deck that speaks their company uh, mission language. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Sorry, we just have a clarification question from the audience uh, sure. from Angie. Uh, she just uh, asked if you can speak to the workaround. Oh, the workaround for artists. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so I think uh, I think Sally, uh, we were just talking about how businesses oftentimes or organizations oftentimes don't uh, fund individual artists, but there's a workaround around that. Um, and oftentimes you can ask a nonprofit or arts organization to present your work as an artist so they can uh, do the fundraising for you. Um, is there, I guess, maybe if there's a different way you guys would explain that? I... Yeah, so either, um, yeah, say either approaching uh, an existing ent company um, or arts organization um, that you're aligned with in some way, whether they can, um, be the, I guess, vehicle, <laughs> the, um, or the sponsor in some ways of your project, um, whether it's something, um, that they are actually presenting as part of their programming is that's kind of an easier, uh, fit, sell all of that. Um, but if it's something where like, it's just like a, like a flow through situation, you're going to have to make sure there's a lot of watertight stuff in there around how, um, your practice or your project or whatever it is that you're wanting, uh, to be funded for, um, it has to really align with the, uh, mission and charitable objects of the organ of the sponsoring organization because they're not going to want to jeopardize their um uh charitable status um by uh by just flowing through money um to something that doesn't align with what um what are their stated charitable objects it's a very strict thing around um cra uh, canada revenue agency in terms of having your charitable status, um, that an organization has to stick to, uh, it's in their charter, like what their charitable objects are. So um, that's going to be just a very careful conversation. And ideally you will all have some sort of pre-existing relationship with that organization, I'd say. I will say that it is like like what you mentioned, like if you can become part of the programming of that organization, that will obviously be the easiest way and the smoothest way because then you become part of that organization's like uh, program as an artist where they're presenting you. Um, so you have more time to kind of build that trust, like artistic and personal trust um, with the organization. And I think even just speaking going back to the public funding sector with like Canada Arts Council and like provincial arts councils, it's often beneficial as an individual artist to have relationships with existing arts organizations um, that can support your work or partner with you in some ways by supporting you through like studio space access or, you know, maybe putting you on their newsletter so you get to have that kind of partnership. So it's advantageous I think for just individual artists to always be seeking out uh, valued aligned arts organizations so you can have some kind of presentation partner in the future because with some of the larger Canada Council project grants you need to have a presentation partner to access like the I think for the 60 up to sixty thousand um, dollar project grants or concept to realization um, grants with Canada Council. One tip that I like to share uh, with arts and arts organizations is to save the program from every event you ever attend. I mean, I, people don't do print programs a lot now when we're moving to the world of digital programs, but save those programs and pay attention to the acknowledgements. Who are the people who supported this project and made it happen? And are those people that you are also seeking to get support from? And is there alignment between your work and the work that this other artist was doing? And how was their work funded? Was it funded directly or was it funded through a presentation arrangement? You know, you can learn a lot from just studying programs from every festival and exhibition and event that you go to. Yeah. Or, or their websites too. 
right? Yes. And you look under their their donors or their supporters. And yeah. That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And oftentimes, like, organizations are very open to these kinds of conversations because, like, assuming if you're applying for Arts Council funding, you're kind of applying pretty far in advance because these are the slower funding uh, vehicles, I suppose. Like, it takes a bit longer uh, to get your results back. So oftentimes you're planning Sometimes for me, like I've done definitely two years in advance or a year in advance um, when it comes to planning these things. And um, it doesn't hurt to just present your project to uh, an organization that maybe works within your medium. Um, and, you know, you like to attend their shows because you make similar types of art just to be like, hey, I'm so and so like this is a project and I have an idea for, uh, for can you just sign off on this letter saying that if I get the grant for this project that you be interested in presenting um, my work and organizations are often arts organizations especially are very used to um these kinds of collaborations or letters of support or they already have templates that exist with that so it doesn't hurt to just ask um yeah i also wanted to kind of see uh kind of um in terms of like strategies uh with creating partnerships since we're kind of on this topic um a big part of like feasibility i, I think as an adjudicator with uh funding it's like you're looking at um the strength um of the partnerships um that exists uh within like a certain application um can you guys just kind of speak on that a little bit sure there's going to be a lot of different uh types of partnerships and as you said like different uh, levels of um, engagement I can think of lots of instances where I've been uh, sent an email 11th hour oh we need to a letter of support for our grant that's being submitted can you give us something on letterhead this is the project and say that you support it that I can do no problem um, that I, I can see the value in the program. It's a, a organization or a person that I've worked with before, that kind of thing. And that's kind of this external vouching. Um, in the cases of, can I list you as a program partner? Can I <laughs> list you as a, you know, that kind of thing? Um, you know, that, you know, that will depend at, you know, on when I get that you know, if it's done in like a um, the right way, which is that you're you really are a partner and you've built something up together and, you know, you're bringing something to the table um, at, that they need and but they're the ones that are applying for the grant, but you have something to offer and that kind of thing. Um, that's one thing. Um, but I will say there are instances where I've got that 11th hour thing. And because I either know the person and I know the organization and the project sounds like something that, oh yeah, th that we would definitely benefit from being partnered with in some way, um, I will in good faith say, yes, you can list us as a programming partner. And if you get the money, then we shall sort it out and make it something, uh, make it into something that's uh, in alignment with you know, both our organizations. So there are different ways to approach it and you kind of have to, um, you know, read the room and um, be uh, sensitive to um, uh, the needs of the other partner as well. Like you don't just go in asking for something that's only for your benefit. Think about it. This is another recurring thing. Think about the way that it benefits them or <laughs> what their needs are. So, yeah. Yeah. And also think about partners outside of arts and culture um, for multiple reasons. One, it'll make the project stronger, but also it'll open up more granting avenues. Um, so, you know, if your project is about music and long term care homes, uh, you know, there is uh, an opportunity to look at granting avenues through uh, seniors and seniors, the, the department or ministry of seniors. There might be granting opportunities through health because we're talking about arts and health and healthcare. Um, and then there are new partnership opportunities in each of those areas as well. So even just broadening the, the definition of partnerships and who is a potential partner can be a really interesting process to go through. Uh, we just had a question from the audience oh, that related. Muted, Vicky. Oh, is this better? Yeah. 
Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, we just had oh, a. Never mind. Oh, we just had an <laughs> audience uh, uh, ask uh, something that you had implied about uh, earlier and related to what you're talking about, Rima. But uh, they're interested more about the business funding point. So, how does CRA recognize this, and is it considered similar to a donation in terms of a tax write-off? So, I think they are talking about if someone, if someone who's not in art in the arts is funding an artist, would it be considered a write-off? Oh, um, possibly. If it's a donation, yes. If it is a sponsorship, then no. And CRA's defini definition is if you are getting a benefit in exchange for the money that you're giving, then chances are that's not a donation. Um, it'll de get defined as a sponsorship. So if it's a sponsorship, it's coming out of the business's marketing budget. So it's no different than the business buying an ad in the newspaper are taking it out on the radio. They're sponsoring a show. You know, it's all the same. It is It is what they're doing to market themselves. If they're simply handing you a check because they like your work and they believe in you and want to support it with no expectation in return, then it's classified as a donation and you can give them a tax receipt for it and they can write it off with CRA when they report on their taxes. Oh, no, I, I don't think that's true, actually. Y they can only write it off if you are registered as a charity. Right, sorry, yes, I made that assumption that you are registered as a charity. Yes, you absolutely yeah, yeah. have to be a registered so, <laughs> charity to get a donation. Yeah, yeah. Yes, so yeah, yeah. In order to issue a, a, a what's called tax a charitable receipt. tax yeah. receipt, yeah. Um, you yourself, your organization needs to be registered as a charity. Yeah. Um, or you have to be affiliated with an arts council that does tax receipts for artists yeah. under its umbrella. Like it gets yeah. complicated, right? Like, but yeah, you can't. An individual is not going, you're not going to be able to just issue a tax receipt no. as an individual yeah. To, yeah. to somebody. You can issue them a receipt and they can do it as a business write-off. Like they can say it's, oh yeah, this is part of my community outreach budget as right. a as yeah. an organization but it's yeah. they can't write it off as a charitable donation yeah, yeah. No, that's an important distinction things so i was assuming they're a charity but you're right if they're an independent individual artist then then it's a different conversation yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. which is but that is the reason why you would want to partner with an organization yeah. that is yeah. a charity because that so, is how they have the power to issue that charitable tax receipt. Yes. So actually, okay, so say you're an individual and you have like a rich uncle and they're like, oh yeah, I wanna underwrite your like crazy play for like $10,000 and stuff. Uh, I need a, I just need a charitable tax receipt. <laughs> then potentially you could, you can't do that, that this, but you could, go to a, a theater company that has mm -hmm. a charitable has charitable status and you can say hey listen <laughs> like i have a a donor um who you know if you can issue a charitable tax receipt um i can bring my production either as part of your programming thing or if for whatever reason they're not into uh, adding you to their season, which it, it could also be a likelihood, you could say, well, can you just say that it's part of your, say, community development? I don't know. If there's a creative way that they can make what your thing fits into their charitable objects, <laughs> then they could potentially be the conduit through which uh, your uncle would give them the money, they would give your uncle the tax receipt, and then they would flow the money to you to do your thing. However, they would probably take like a 10, 15% administrative cut out of that. So I know instances where that's happened and it's been totally fine. Um, but you just, again, it's that airtight thing that I was talking about. It has to airtight fit in with the charitable objects of the sponsoring uh, charity. Because and usually, they, they don't want to jeopardize that. Yeah, and usually organizations, they'll know right away, like whether yeah. this project is going to be a fit or right. not. Right. Um, and I think that's why the conversation about sponsorship is so important because I think for emerging 
arts organizations that don't have charitable status, for example, like, you know, like a emerging nonprofit arts nonprofit that hosts, you know, music events and things like that. Um, they're not going to be able to, they might not have the capacity to be reaching out or to be doing, they're, they're focused on doing one thing. Um, then maybe they're not reaching out and thinking broader uh, fundraising kind of um, uh, techniques or avenues. So they're uh, just working within their organization and it makes sense for them to be um, asking for sponsorships because those are things that are easy to to kind of get because those are just yeah. coming out of their marketing and advertising budget to, for it's like a very direct and clear exchange of services uh, mm -hmm. between like an organized, especially if you're doing event related um, kind of productions where you, you host shows and things like that, that it's very easy to be like, well, we have 300 people that come every single month, you know, so this is a yeah. clear advertising kind of exchange uh, with like with mm -hmm. a private company. Yeah. yeah. One caveat around the sponsorship thing is um, like a lot of times there are these uh, deliverables or what they call, um, I, I can't remember, there's terminology around that. Oh, activations. Mm -hmm. So you have to um, be crystal clear around who is responsible for any expenses associated with these activations because uh, I have also seen instances where organizations where the expectation, the unwritten expectation was that the organization would just take care of everything. And in the end, they netted out very minimal um, money stuck to them in the end after they subtracted, you know, the expense of activating the sponsorship. So when you're doing the contract, um, have to make sure that um, any activation expenses are sorted out who's responsible for what and make sure when you calculate it that the net the amount of money that's sticking to you that it's worth all the effort and trouble um to for that sponsorship yeah um we are running oh hi vicky <laughs> i just saw your <laughs> message about the q a <laughs> no worries we just have a lot of questions i know that's why i was so. like Maybe yeah. we can jump into some of the Q and A stuff. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So uh, there's a few questions. So I'm gonna just go the, in the order of when they were submitted. Uh, these are more of the broader questions that uh, uh, that uh, you can all uh, answer. Um, so our first one is um, uh, just sort of some common misconceptions that an average person might have when applying for arts funding. So to their great surprise, an arts foundation told them that applying to multiple funders for the same project and budget is a no-no, but I thought that the approach should be like applying for a job as in apply everywhere to increase your odds. Wow, that's really odd. No, but projects often have multiple public funders at different levels, municipal, provincial, and federal. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I wonder if it's a case where the budget for each funder didn't include the other potential funder in it. You know, like if the budget to Canada Council said, you're giving us 50,000 and that's what we need, and the budget to the different body said, oh, yeah. you're giving us 50,000 and that's all we need. I wonder if that's maybe... You know, normally if you're ex expecting to approach three different funders who will all collectively make up your project, they should all be in the budget. Yeah, but if you're just yeah. shopping it around, then it gets tricky because, you know, you, you know, you're not going to get them all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As an artist, like even for my own, like uh, I've gotten like a concept to realization grant from Canada Council. Um, and even for that lump sum of funding, like they're the biggest funder, but within that mm -hmm. grant, I have multiple sources of funding from like BC Arts Council, uh, from multiple arts organizations paying me residency fees, performance fees from festivals. So it's very normal, even as an individual artist, to have like multiple streams of revenue uh, to support a project. Yeah. Uh, the next question I have is at the uh, about the actual funding application when adding actual budget items. How would you advise a first timer to come up with a number for either substance or artist fees? It's hard to come up with the number when you're so new. For example, for instance, is it okay to come up with a subsist subsistence budget number to cover all basic living expenses? And how can someone calculate an artist fee that is reasonable when you're so new, you just don't know how much you would charge for your work? 
Okay, I'm all over this one. So I used to work for Carfac, uh, Ontario, which is the provincial chapter of an organization called Carfac, Canadian Artist Representation. Um, and you can uh, Google them. Uh, it's Carfac, C-A-R-F-A-C, Carfac. And they actually have an artist fee schedule, uh, which it looks like a super complicated document, but you can go in there and look under the artist fee schedule and whether it's for this is sorry and this is for visual artists um if it's for like a solo uh exhibition at a really huge gallery or if it's for a group show at an artist run center and everything in between they'll have different instances they even have breakdowns for if you're asked to do an artist talk if you know a show an exhibit that's happening they want to use uh one of your pieces as the cover for their marketing materials there's a fee in there for that so at, at any point where um you could and should be compensated for your labor um there will be a fee in there for that one thing that i would always tell people is that that uh it's called a minimum fee schedule. I would stress the word minimum. That is the floor. So that's like, say you're just like a recent graduate out of school and like, that's what you would ask for. If you are somebody who has a, a track record, you've shown elsewhere, this, that, and the other, you can absolutely negotiate more than that. Um, but you use that as a baseline and it's great because it's this objective third party thing <laughs> and and you can um it's very, uh, in fact i'd say most uh, funders uh l they'll ask um are you offering artist fees in your project yes no um and how did you calculate those artist fees and all you have to say is i went by the carfax fee schedule check and you're all good um, I know for the media arts sector, um, IMA, there's in, I -M -A -A, Independent Media Arts Alliance. They're sort of the, the equivalent of CARFAC, but for the media arts sector. So for anything to do with um, film and that kind of thing. Um, I'm not sure what's out there for um, dance and music and that kind of thing. Okay, I see something in there. Fee guidelines for dance artists and um and there's equity guidelines for theater okay it's caa the it. canadian artists equity association i think okay and then i know there's uh the toronto musicians uh the musicians union but i've heard that those fees are not uh realistic towards um say popular music that a lot of them are for things like orchestras or for like orchestras working in musicals and things like that? Yeah, for music, um, it's a little bit funnier, but sometimes we actually use, I actually reference Carfax sometimes, I know it's for visual arts, but um, sometimes even for just like minimum performance fees and stuff like that, um, yeah. it, it does have like, I mean, it is for more geared towards visual arts, but it does have like a general guideline for like a performance, like minimum, if you're doing a performance, like what that, it's like, I think like, 360 or something like that um at the moment but these are like you said minimum fees um unfortunately i do feel like sometimes organizations lean too hard on the minimum um and oh, they yeah. could really be asking for more um yeah. the second part of this question talks about subsistence um usually with funding guidelines um they should have a minimum like a maximum like by week kind of subsistence amount that you can ask for uh, for the duration of your project um do you guys want to look at the guy <laughs> not to sound like <laughs> i would say look at the grant guidelines because a lot of them under eligible expenses will tell you whether or not you can include that and in some of them under ineligible they will say that that they don't or it depends on the program if it if it's for like creation and that kind of thing a lot of the the time what they're buying is your your free time that's what they're paying for is to free up your time and that is the subsistence part right but for sure i would say do not be shy about including if it's for your own project pay pay yourself make sure you pay yourself 
because that is something as an adjudicator on grants where the person hasn't budgeted in any money for themselves for as the artist where we've been like why did they why didn't they do that and it's a it is a little bit of a flag yeah. that um that the numbers are not adhering to some sort of real world uh like what's actually happening in the real world great thanks so much uh our next question is about uh arts and community sponsored support so canadian heritage bcah for a festival finds an eligible uh community night market events or a venue that falls inside of an exhibition that charges a gate fee how do you work around arts and community sponsored support could you repeat that please vicky yeah i'm trying to um Let's see if I can remember what they're trying to say. I think they're saying that the Canadian Heritage, like the is BCAH, the funder uh, is finding festivals like this ineligible. So including community night market events or a venue that falls inside of an, of an exhibition that charges a gate fee. Um, how do you work around arts and community sponsored support? So I think they're asking um so i'm not sure if this is specifically what they're asking but i have encountered in the past certain grants that are only available if your project is publicly accessible with no financial barrier so i i wonder if that's what this question is getting at is that if your event if your art project is taking place at an exhibition that has or a place that has a ticket fee or a gate fee then you're ineligible for funding. Um, I personally don't know of a way to get around that for that specific project stream. My advice would be to find a different way to fund it because if if the the baseline is that your your art has to be publicly accessible with no financial barrier, then a ticket right away is a financial barrier, unless there is a pay what you can night or there is admission by donation special night. And maybe that portion of your project can be funded if you can make a case that we are making it accessible on some nights through this other means where the ticket price isn't applicable. I'm not sure if that's directly answering their question though, but that's one example that I can think of. Yeah, and feel free if we haven't answered your question, if you want to. Uh, oh, I've got a BCAH calls the shots of what you can do by calling what you do ineligible, not sure. Mm. Yeah. yeah, so if you look at um, the mandate of what the program is, if the program is for um, community-centered events and they wanna make sure that it's like a for free festivals only, then that's the parameter. That's what they want to fund. They don't want to fund uh, an outdoor fair where you have to, where there's uh, revenue being generated by taking tickets. They want it to be a free event, something in a yeah. public park that anybody can attend. That is their program design. And that is the intent of, yeah. of why they created the program. Having said that, um, there might be, if you have an event where you wanna charge tickets and that kind of thing, um, there are other avenues like the, like you know sponsorships and things like that and um there may or may not be other programs under other um ministries or other uh, government programs i'm thinking like i know provincially in ontario we had something called celebrate ontario these were for like um you know big marquee type events um Although, hmm, I'm wondering, that might be also be like a non-ticketed. I'd have to look at the guidelines. <laughs> so in any case, I mean, um, it, there's a reason why uh, certain funds are designed in certain ways. And obviously for that specific program you're talking about, the no cost barrier is one of the pillars of that program, obviously, which is why yours is ineligible. 
Yeah. But you can look at sponsors just as you're saying, right? So, and it depends on how your budget uh, breaks out to be. For example, if you're expecting a thousand dollars from ticket, ticket sales and you need a $5,000 grant to make this happen, then is there a sponsor who can be your admission sponsor and give you the thousand dollars so you can actually make it free? And then you can still access the grant money and you got your thousand dollars that you needed from ticket sales, but you just didn't charge a ticket fee anymore because a sponsor covered it for you. Uh, but that- <laughs> that only will work if your ticket sale revenue isn't uh, enormous in terms of your budget proportions, because otherwise you need a very large sponsor and you need to have enough leeway then in terms of your timelines for when you started looking into this to line up all of those pieces. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rima. That was, time and money. <laughs> that was amazing. I didn't even think my brain didn't even go there, but you're sp you're. <laughs> You are navigating all of this uh, with these brilliant ideas. Um, uh, yeah, they just had a comment that it's not explicit in their guidelines. It ends up being subjective and being very frustrating working with sponsors, but they thank you for <laughs> your response. All right. Um, that one's done too. Okay. Um, our next question is about... Um, Often funding seems extremely out of date. For example, they only offer $2,000 for a music video. Do you think any of that will evolve? Um, I think depending on the grant, right? Some grants, like if it's a grant that offers $2,000 from a music video, obviously they don't expect you to make like a super high production um, project, you know? So I think there are other grants for music videos that give more funding um, for music video, like 10K. Um, but I think if that particular grant is doing a two thousand dollar budget for a music video then i think it's up to you as a creator to scope within that budget because it is possible to make lyric videos or smaller kind of like production performance videos uh within that budget or, or find other sources of funding too yes yeah mm -hmm. Uh, next as uh, question is, uh, as, an ex uh, as an assessor, I have occasionally seen personal contributions as part of the financing. This is where the artist applicant makes a financial contribution to the project budget. What does a panel think about this as a practice? Uh, I think it's legitimate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think... Um... I mean, I think like, I, at least in the music realm is like everyone, it's like pretty much you're working a day job to pay for your <laughs> music recording. So I think for a lot of art practices, it's like, it's actually an investment um, to like record an album um, and you're often not seeing returns, like unless you, you know, unless you get like a big sync deal or like licensing deal, oftentimes it's, it is like a labor of love in many ways. Maybe the thing to do is to, as the line item, just say um, private sector contributions, and then maybe in your budget note, just say <laughs> that you're just not to draw so much attention uh, yeah. to it. Yeah. And it also depends on what some of the criteria of the um, specific program or fund or, you know, is going to be like, is it that they want to see that um that you have some sort of community backing or whatever in that case it's better that it's somebody else <laughs> or or um yeah i don't know there's i guess there are multiple ways to slice it it depends on who's going to be on the jury how they're going to perceive that too yeah also, in the absence of any explicit guidelines uh, around that yeah, I think it depends on because I've definitely seen it where it's a bit funky on like as an assessor on a grant where, you know, they're paying themselves like a huge artist. Like, for example, is that maybe they're paying themselves a huge artist fee and huge substance fee. And then they're like doing like a personal contribution that is like equally right. huge as well. So right. I think it really depends on how that information is presented in relation to the rest of the budget. Yeah. Yeah. And what the whole project looks like, too. So these are, you know, uh, again, the people who are looking at these uh, grants, like we're we're humans and and pe from the community, and we're looking at everything holistically, right? 
All right, we just have five more questions. So we have 50 minutes left, so we're just going to okay. try to punch through, through as many as we can. Uh, so the, our next question is, how do you think government funders have shifted to prioritize diverse voices? How do you feel BIPOC artists can balance the need for more diverse stories with the ever-present imposter syndrome? I'd say there's definitely greater um, awareness within mainstream funding programs that aren't specifically uh, like envelopes of funding that are dedicated to BIPOC artists. Uh, there's better awareness, for instance, in terms of comp jury composition and stuff like that. Um, and a lot of programs will explicitly, or some funders will uh, will have sort of priority groups that are upfront articulated. Um, so yeah, so there's definitely a greater awareness around that. Um, in terms of what was the thing? Um, imposter, syndrome. imposter syndrome. Yeah, how do you feel BIPOC artists can balance the need for more diverse stories with the ever-present imposter syndrome? So, you know, I feel like we've moved to this kind of representation 2.0 at this point where it's not enough just to be BIPOC. It's like you have to have an interesting story to tell that is unique and not necessarily a stereotype or not necessarily bending backwards to break a stereotype or, you know, like it's, you know, the, I mean, people talk, I, I, I've been hearing the word authenticity used a lot, but then there's a critique around that too, in terms of notions of authenticity being um, very um, essentializing. So the phrase that I like to use is, and that I've borrowed from other people is cultural specificity. So if you are just really talking about or writing or expressing about what you know, uh, based on like connected to your um, racial identity, um, you shouldn't worry about imposter syndrome because you're, you're writing from your truth, right? Yeah, um, I, I, you said it beautifully. So <laughs> um, I think you just have to, you know, believe in your story, your story matters. And it doesn't matter because you're a, a, a BIPOC artist, it matters because it's a human story. And human stories like yours might not have been shared a lot in the past before, you know, so it's time for those stories to be shared. But ultimately, if it's an authentic uh, work, if it's an authentic story, and it's yours, and you connect to it, then, you know, stand behind it. Perfect. And uh, our next question is a little bit broader uh, for uh, artists that never applied for grants before. How do you decide if you should apply to the federal level, like Canada Arts Council, a provincial level, or a municipal level, like a Toronto Art Council? Do you generally apply to all three levels and see which one approves the grant? As an artist, yes. <laughs> I think, I mean... As a practicing artist that is constantly working, trying to find work, um, yes, I would say so. Like, it depends on your project dates as well, too. So it depends on what, how the dates of these funding uh, deadlines fall in within your project dates. Um, but I would, as a just like someone who fundraises for my own project, I always try to seek out every level because that's every opportunity. Because you never know, you might you might not get a certain fund and you might your municipal fund might kick in to help you make the project happen so yes and i'm gonna say and funders like to, sorry go ahead oh i'm gonna say the really good news is that once for a, one project once you write one grant for that one project that you can repurpose so yeah. much of what you write for that one grant for the other grants even if it's for like a different type of program or whatever uh yeah repurpose repurpose what you've already written and but make sure you tailor it to the specific yeah. program yeah so but you're yeah. not starting from scratch every time you write a new grant i, I don't know if i'm stating the obvious but <laughs> there you go no and funders like to see multiple levels of government involved it you know nothing makes a funder in general uh happier than seeing others are also coming to the table with money. And so it's only a good thing if there are multiple levels of government that say yes to your project and are involved and are interested in supporting it. So you want to 
hit every level of government that you can. And as a further uh, word of encouragement, I will say that uh, I know that the TAC in their annual um, report, as one of their metrics of um, the great work that <laughs> they're doing, they included um, first time grantees mm -hmm. as a way of demonstrating that they are um, attentive to uh, to emerging artists or junior yeah. artists and stuff. So. Um, yeah, I think people, you know, depending, there are some grantors, they, they want to share the wealth or they want to welcome um, first time artists. And, and there are programs specifically for emerging artists as well. So you should be, be encouraged. <laughs> All right, our next one is about foundations. So are there not some foundations that fund arts and isn't this again a different relationship than governments and corporations? They often have very specific criteria. How much of an opportunity do they actually represent? That's the it's charitable status thing. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge opportunity if you have the charitable status to do research on what foundations will fund your work and are aligned with your work. Um, and if you don't know where to start, start with community foundations or, or donor advised funds, because they these are organizations that pool money from different sources and are giving it out to two different charities. But you have to have charitable st status to start and um, you have to do your research and you can just, you know, if you don't know where to start, honestly, you can just Google arts foundations in Alberta. I, I'm just making that up. But, you know, where whatever you're trying to look for, start there or start with the community foundations of Canada. Perfect. You guys are doing great to answering all these questions. All right. Our next one is uh, they have just registered as a not-for-profit or art organization, uh, but they don't have any history for the organization. However, they have been working in the art field for a couple of years and has experience collaborating with Canadian art orgs. Um, how can they apply uh, for a grant for the new organization? Uh, and do they accept a new one or does it need to run for a while and then they can start applying for grants? That yeah, depends so, on the guideline, I think, right? Yeah, so typically there are two different types of funding available through the arts councils. There's what's called operating funding and then there's project funding. So typically for operating funding, you will have to have um, done or received, um, whether it's like two or three project grants from that funder in order to be eligible to apply for operating funding. For project funding, um, I don't think there's a, there's no official barrier around um, that you have to have received money at any point. So for project grants, it's, it's open, open uh, field. For, um, I just know this for municipal, for City of Vancouver municipal funding, um, you do need to be a nonprofit because you, you can only access like municipal funding through nonprofits in Vancouver. Uh, you do need to be in existence for like over six months or something like that. So I think it does state in the guideline if you are a new organization, like how long you need to be in operation or uh, for before you can apply for a, a grant. Yeah, so I think, yeah, um, it may or may not be the case for a TAC, but I know that there are grants where it says um, for organizations or collectives. So yep. I know they will grant money to collectives, um, but I know that I think when they cut the check, it has to be in one person's name. Yeah. <laughs> so one person in that collective. So as a collective, you need to sort that kind of stuff out and maybe open a business uh, bank account or something like that. Yeah. All right. So we are at 725. So unfortunately, we are going to have to um, close out some of the questions here. But uh, I have um, uh, some good news is Nancy is actually hosting an Ask Me Anything session next 
Monday, October 23rd, uh, specifically on some of the questions that uh, you've answered. So for example, uh, I had an, a question about any advice for emerging artists or for someone who has never applied for funding before. I had a question about uh, where can they see sample grant applications that have successfully received grants and are these published? Another question is how can an emerging artist stand out without a large social media presence? So a lot of these uh, really specific questions Nancy will be able to answer them in our next session. It'll be entirely a Q&A session uh, for you to ask any burning questions. And Nancy will be able to sort of demystify sort of uh, all these um, questions about working with funders. Um, uh, Nancy, do you have any, uh, anything you want to close out with? Yeah, I just, wanna, I, I just want to say thank you to Sally and Rima for your invaluable uh, information and I feel like I've learned a lot um, in just having this conversation with you and I'm just I'm eager to like check out more of your work and I hope everyone um, can check out because uh, maybe Rima do you want to drop the link to your or has maybe Vicky dropped the link to your organization Vicky just did thank okay. you Vicky <laughs> sweet okay <laughs> um, yeah so I just want to thank both of you yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, to all of you, and especially Vicky for reaching out to us to participate in this. It's yeah, it's nice to to know that there's a bunch of us out there who are trying to make things uh, happen on different fronts. And that's great, Nancy. You're doing the Lord's work with uh, <laughs> doing the AMA <laughs> and just yeah, all, all the stuff you're involved with. Yeah, so it's great. And Rima, all the amazing work you're doing at Business Arts. Good. Likewise. Thanks, everyone. It was such a pleasure. Um, and Nancy, uh, or sorry, Vicky did uh, put in the link for ArtsVest. So if anyone's curious, uh, please check out the website. It is a free training program focused uh, specifically on sponsorships and it includes access to mentors as well as tons of free resources and tools and templates that can help you if you don't know where to start. And you can also reach out to me personally anytime. Um, and I'm sure Vicky could share my contact information if anyone had any questions. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, CISF. Yes, we we are in the business of funding uh, <laughs> um, uh, film people working in screen based industries from black and racialized communities. Uh, right now, the one fund that we have, um, we just uh, wrapped up our third round, but we'll be announcing our fourth round um, uh, next spring. Um, but in the meantime, I'm also trying to raise uh, a bunch of money. Uh, at the federal level so that we can offer more funding programs also. Yeah, if anyone was uh, specifically asking about Canada Council for the Arts, uh, Farah was here earlier. Uh, she just mentioned that she couldn't stay. So feel free to uh, just put in the link her email address. So if you have very specific questions related to Canada Council for the Arts, um, she'd be happy to help out as a program officer. Um, and then, yeah, so I just want to thank you so much, Nancy, Sally, and Rima for joining us today. Uh, again, if you didn't get your questions answered today, or if you think of any more questions after this discussion, Nancy is hosting the AMA session uh, next Monday, October 23rd, at the same time as the session. Uh, this is across Canada, so uh, I won't name out all the, uh, the, uh, the, the time zones, but it's 5 p.m. Eastern time all the way to, I think it's like, was it nine o'clock uh, Atlantic time? <laughs> 5 p.m. Pacific time, yeah. Pacific time, sorry, Pacific time, sorry, yes. Nine o'clock Atlantic, yep. <laughs> yeah, perfect. So, um, and so if you've ever been intimidated by arts grants or don't know how to start, this is your chance to ask all your burning questions as Nancy uh, demystifies the work. So it will be um, uh, a one hour and a half session as well. So uh, I want to close out by uh, thanking the Canada Council for the Arts and Festival Access Z for making this Canada, Canada Asian Arts Network project possible. So if you are an Asian Canadian artist looking for more support, visibility and community connection, uh, we'd love to invite you to join the free network at, um, at canasianarts.com and follow us on all our social media platforms. If you're interested in getting the link for Nancy's AMA session next week, uh, please um, join our newsletter um, and we'll send out that Zoom link uh, uh, pretty soon. So we have hope this roundtable has been helpful for your artistic journey and yeah, thank you for coming and take care. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.